The next topic to discuss is about uh, Schrodinger model uh, of the atom. So here, or at least of quantum mechanics. Uh, this is a very, very detailed uh, model, but all we have to learn in our high school physics class, at least, is just the very basics, the very essence of it. Because there's an entire course is based on you know, Schrodinger's model and Schrodinger's equation and solutions to it and how everything works. But the basic idea is that uh, in order to understand the atom, that electrons in the atom or you know, other particles uh, can be described by some sort of wave function psi. And of course, that uh, equation itself is not such a simple concept. Uh, this is an equation that describes this wave uh, at any point, any time, in three dimensions. Now, this wave function psi doesn't really have that much physical meaning. It doesn't tell us much directly. It basically tells us that there's a superposition of all the different states. So, for example, we could be talking about the position of uh, particles, like, for example, electrons. So, again, if we were trying to understand what's going on, maybe in our uh, atom here, uh, this equation could tell us about where the different uh, electrons could actually be. In a hydrogen atom, which only has one electron, the question would be, uh, you know, where is that electron? Is it up here in this orbital, or is it over here? So his uh, wave equations uh, could end up actually telling us about all the superpositions of all the positions of, the, of uh, this electron. And it turns out that according to this wave equation, everything is allowed. All the superpositions are allowed. Now, since it doesn't have that much physical meaning, there is something important that you can do with it, though. Uh, I would definitely put a big star by this thing right here. That's, uh, if they're going to ask you anything about Schrodinger's model on an IB exam, it's normally going to be this, that what happens, though, with this wave? As any wave equation, it has some sort of amplitude term. In other words, you know, if we're talking about some sort of wave, I mean, here, of course, I'm drawing a simple one-dimensional uh, wave, or I suppose it's two-dimensional here. And uh, this wave, for example, we could talk about some sort of amplitude. In other words, from the middle to the top right here, for example, how high does that go? And that we can consider some sort of amplitude. And it turns out if we take that amplitude and we square it, that tells us actually the probability of finding that uh, particle, so in this case an electron, at a particular point. So, that, so it can tell us something, tell us something about the probability. Now there's something called the Copenhagen Interpretation. And of course, that's named because uh, a lot of the quantum mechanics being done was, uh, you know, by people like Schrodinger and uh, Planck and Heisenberg and also Niels Bohr, as well as uh, Albert Einstein. And uh, they ended up figuring out some really strange stuff, of course, that uh, yes, there are lots of possibilities allowed with these wave functions. But this Copenhagen interpretation of it was that once you make an observation, though, your wave function will collapse to give one solution. So this brought up, uh, I think, something actually kind of funny. It's called uh, Schrodinger's cat. It was an example that he had given just to talk about the absurdity of this. In other words, talking about how something can be in many different states. Of course, they're doing this on a very small scale. But he decided to say, well, you know, we could take the same idea and bring it to a larger scale. So the idea behind this uh, Schrodinger's cat idea is, uh, is just to show that these different, you know, superposition of different states, it sounds a bit silly and it ends up actually not really making much sense, and yet it turns out that's one of the ways of uh, explaining things in quantum mechanics. It's all about uncertainty. So the idea behind his uh, cat experiment, first of all, he didn't actually do any experiments with cats. I've read some things from people who actually thought that he was sitting there uh, you know, doing experiments and hurting cats. But his idea was a thought experiment. So he said, well, imagine though you put a cat in an opaque box, so that's a box that you can't see through. And uh, so that way you can't observe your cat. Now also in that box is some sort of flask. Uh, so it could be like a poisonous gas or something like that. And now that uh, poisonous gas is either released or not, uh, depending on some random event. So for example, maybe you put a radioactive substance uh, in that box. And that radioactive substance, of course, uh, learning about radioactivity, you know that um, the probability of uh, an atom decaying is random. So, another, uh, I mean, the, the probability of it, I mean, it exists, there's a probability. So, I mean, we don't really know when it'll happen. It just, we can talk about a probability of it actually happening. So, assuming you had some sort of situation where it was an even probability of this particle decaying or not, and you have some sort of system that links this particle decaying with the cat dying. So, for example, if the particle decays, uh, then it releases this poisonous gas, and so then the cat dies. So basically the idea is the cat's either alive or not based on if this 
atom decayed or not, so something random. So his concept was that, well, if we actually, uh, you know, at any given moment, you know, from outside the box, so from our sort of measuring point, the cat is in a state of indeterminacy. I mean, we can't tell if the cat's alive or dead because we can't open the box. So from a theoretical perspective, the cat's both alive and dead at the same time. In other words, there's a superposition of uh, many different states. However, as soon as we open the box, of course, we, we force all the different probabilities, all the different superpositions to collapse and give us one answer. That was just the idea behind his cat. So no, he didn't actually hurt any cats. And the last thing from this, at least, is uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. I like this little t-shirt here. Uh, that's actually from Think Geek. But um, so Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. We can look at our equation sheet and it tells us something about it here. We can see that uh, these are these next two equations here. So I'll just write them down because uh, they're actually pretty important. Okay, so we've got the first one here is delta x delta p is greater than uh, or equal to h over 2 pi. I'm just going to write them down first. The next one says delta e delta t is greater than or equal to h over 2 pi. Now let's define these things. What delta x is, is the, the uncertainty on position. Whereas the delta p, of course, is the uncertainty on momentum. And of course, the delta E then is the uncertainty on energy. And the delta T, the uncertainty on time. So this tells us something about, uh, oops, actually, uh, just need to be careful. I'm just putting these little quotation marks, just saying it's the same thing as uncertainty on position. So your delta P, delta E, delta T. So what this said is uh, Heisenberg was actually able to figure out that due to uh, these quantum mechanics effects uh, and not due to your own precision in your lab, it turns out no matter how good you think you are, if uh, you know, you know, let's say uh, something's position really well, then you won't know its momentum very well. So this tells you something about um, how it's impossible to detect both things with, uh, with really great precision. So no matter how good your experiment is, you, so this doesn't have to do with, oh, just get a better lab equipment or just get a better setup. Turns out, no, he was able to show that if you know something's position really well, then you'll know pretty much nothing about its momentum. In other words, the better you know one of these, the worse you know the other one. You can't ever know both of them to 100% uh, you know, well, so to speak. So when you know one better, you know the other one worse. Same thing, by the way, with energy. If you know the energy... Uh, then you don't know much about the time and vice versa. So of course, this momentum term carries uh, a velocity in it. And so uh, that reminds me of uh, one of my favorite jokes. It's a really bad one, I think, but uh, if you talk to physicists, they'll usually laugh. And remember now, we just talked about how you can know position um, or momentum, which contains a velocity term. So the joke is, it's really short, is that Heisenberg's driving in his car and he gets pulled over for speeding. And the police officer asks him, you know, how, do you have any idea how fast you were going? And then Heisenberg says, no, but I know exactly where I am. Uh -huh. So basically what the, this Heisenberg uncertainty principle is important for is it tells us something to do with uncertainty. And it's all about probabilities, which actually changes things immensely. I mean, in sort of classical mechanics, you would think that well, as long as you knew the position and, you know, all these initial conditions of a situation well enough, you could predict everything that's going to happen. The problem is now with uh, modern quantum mechanics, we know that that doesn't seem to be the case. It turns out no matter how well you know things, you're still going to have uncertainty no matter what. Uh, so this sort of changes everything. Then it's all just a matter of figuring out probabilities of things. And some people really hated this uh, concept. In fact, uh, Einstein was famous for, uh, for saying something to the effect of, you know, he hates the fact that you know, God seems to play dice. So he actually said, you know, I don't believe that God plays dice. The idea was because, you know, it seems like the universe seems to be something to do with probability, and uh, lots of people don't really like that. And yet a lot of evidence seems to show that there is some truth to this right here. So there's definitely something to it, and that's why this t-shirt is funny, because I'm certain about quantum mechanics.